The Swamp Thing was created in 1972 by Len Wein and Bernie Wrightson. Now there's a new incarnation of The Swamp Thing by artists Stephen Bissett and John Tottleman and writer Alan Moore. It's one of DC's fastest growing fan favorites. We asked Len what he thinks of the new Swamp Thing. Biggest yeah. question people ask me is, how could you let him do that to your characters? You know, how, how they, don't you hate what he's doing? You know, and people who don't realize that I picked him to do that. I have no problems with it. It's his book now. He's taken it in different places. I really enjoy what he's doing with the book. And I, as, as Karen Berger probably attests, as soon as a new script comes in, I demand a copy as soon as she's done reading it, just so I can see what he's doing. I'm fascinated by it. One of the reasons the book works so well is the shared vision of the Swamp Thing's artistic team. Editor Karen Berger coordinates their efforts. Before Alan even came to the book, um, Steve and John had their own visions of the character, and coincidentally it happened to be Alan's, you know, really? close to Alan's as well in terms of getting into, um, really revamping the character and uh, really getting to the horror aspect of the book. We asked Alan Moore to give us his ideas about horror. We're going to try and actually focus upon the reality of American horror and see if we've got some good material there to turn horror comics out of. You know, that, that's the plans. You seem to be focusing on some world horror too, aren't you going to deal with nuclear yeah. war? And well, I tend to think that uh, the horror that existed in the 40s with the Universal films, uh, it's played out. It's a different audience now. I mean, what frightens people these days is not the idea of a werewolf jumping out at them. Uh, it's the, the idea of a nuclear war or any of the sort of the things that we have coursing through our society at the moment you know and I think that to really frighten people you have to somehow ground the horror in their own experience things that they're frightened of I mean in a recent swamp thing I managed to touch upon uh, bug fear you know because everybody's frightened of bugs you know it doesn't matter how big and tough they are you know you get a big enough spider and so everybody backs away from it so um I suppose it's a bit cynical and manipulating, but I do like to try and put my finger upon the exact nerve, if possible, of what really scares people. It's sort of, it's sadism, and I'm getting paid for it, you know. <laughs> but you also you have a conviction that about writing that what you're scared of, you won't write something that you're not scared of? Or? Certainly. I mean, I think there was, there was one of those ancient Chinese sages who say so, so many deep and interesting things, and they said that in order for your audience to enjoy your work. You've got to enjoy it. You've got to feel really strongly about what you're doing in order to have the conviction to actually communicate it to another person. If you write a funny story and you don't laugh, then why should anybody else? And if you write a story that doesn't frighten you, then you're not going to frighten anybody else. I mean, I actually reduce myself to sort of slobbering terror in, in the course of writing some of these stories. You know, you have to really press the buttons that, that make you feel disturbed, you know, which uh, probably puts my family under great stress because, you know, I'm sort of sitting there under my, my writing table gibbering with my hands over my eyes, you know. But, um, yeah, I do feel that strongly. It has to affect you or it's not going to affect anybody else. How do you write? What is your, your mood? Uh, well, I have done a little bit of acting in a very minor way, so... I try to approach writing from a, a method acting point of view, you know, the Marlon Brando touch. So like, in order to write Swamp Thing, you have to, to lay in a bath with a load of mud and lug worms for a couple of weeks, and then you're in about the right mood to, to actually sit down and write a Swamp Thing script, you know. Okay. Now answer me seriously. Surely. Well, I, I don't know, that is pretty serious. I mean, I, I do get into a character to the point where uh, I sit in front of a mirror and try and imagine what it would feel like to be that character, how their body would feel, whether it would be heavier than mine or lighter than mine, how they'd move. And uh, it's pretty psychotic. I'm glad I work alone, because if anyone could see me while I was working, then I would uh, probably be in one of the jackets that does up at the back by now, you know. But, uh, yeah, I sit there in front, and I put on a voice. I talk to myself. I probably, probably shouldn't be revealing this in front of an audience. But, uh, yeah, I mean, I do. I actually get into the part where I'm acting out my dialogue and seeing how it sounds mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, trying to imagine a real person saying it and that, that does help to get the flow sure. and to get the characters accurate mm -hmm. and I think, I think people can tell in the final analysis you know. but again it's something where if I've got a particularly uh, horrible character to portray then it doesn't do very much for the people around me for, for the days when I'm writing that character you know, it's, uh, I'll become a pretty unpleasant person for that, that stretch of time you know 
How does your family deal with that? Who are your, your family? Tell us about uh, my, my, my wife, Phyllis, and uh, my two adorable daughters, Leah and Amber, uh, three and six. And they've got used to it by now. You know, that they see sort of um, daddy coming downstairs with a strange expression on his face. And, uh, yeah, I mean, th th they know. They don't get alarmed by it anymore. The success of, of the Swamp Thing is um, kind of amazing because the horror genre is not one that that usually... Or am I wrong in that? Oh, you're, you're right. I think that the horror genre, while it was popular about ten years ago, uh, in comics at least, I think that Swamp Thing is the only surviving book in the horror field. Now, I find that strange because as comics have, horror comics have lost their popularity, then horror itself seems to have permeated every other art form to excess. Um, the film industry uh, is a whole string of murdered teenagers. You know, I mean, just, just all these sort of chop them up films. You know, I mean, that is, that's not the sort of horror that I like to do, but it is horror. And it seems that people are really crying out for that stuff. Uh, I don't know why, you know, when, when things are so miserable anyway, why they should sort of want something that makes them feel even more depressed, but then that's people for you. You know, I think that, uh, for my part, what you have to do is do horror that actually scares people. Because in comics, I think that a lot, you have people going through the motions. Um, you'll get a funny comic book that is not actually funny. Uh, you'll recognize that it's a funny comic book because it's got characters with big noses and big feet but you could never in a million years laugh at it. And you'll get horror comic books which, uh, although they've got werewolves and vampires and things that go bump in the night in them, then they don't really raise your hackles very much. You know, I think that with Swamp Thing, we have tried to do a book which will actually scare its readership, you know. And, yeah, it seems that it's working, you know, from, from what I hear. To find out what Alan's um, planning on scaring the readership with in the future, we went to editor Karen Berger. It, it's this odyssey that Swamp Thing goes on. It's called the American Gothic and basically Swamp Thing is going through the dark underside of America in order to save the earth from being destroyed by these spiritual people who live on a different plane of existence and since Swamp Thing is in touch with spiritual things now um, he's the likely candidate to do this and um, we're going to be introducing a lot of horror aspects in this as well. We're going to have a couple of vampire stories, a couple of werewolf stories, oh, yeah. um, haunted house stories. And, uh, but it's, it's up to Swamp Thing. I mean, he has to really, he travels all through America, but he also can come back to the swamp because of his teleportation, um, organic teleportation abilities now. So he does come back and visit Abby, who's going to be going on trial actually, for um, living with a swamp creature. <laughs> this is the piece of art that got Stephen John the job on the swamp thing. Alan met his collaborators recently for the first time. Steve and John are terrific. I mean, I could that they're a pair of absolute maniacs, and uh, there is no one better to work on swamp thing. I mean, it was quite extraordinary. When I was asked to take over the book, uh, one of the things that I was asked was, uh, you know, like, uh, what do you want to do with the character? And I started thinking about it and uh, trying to come up with a way in which we could make him more of a swamp thing, uh, that we could show all the little patches of fungus and pin mold and lichen that are growing on him, you know, and actually get an impression that this is a vegetable, that he's crawling with insects, that he's, he's a mass of sodden plant fibre. He's not just a guy in a green suit. And... When I wrote this to Stephen and John, I mean, they were saying, yeah, this is just what we want to do. You know, it was just pure coincidence, but in two separate countries, we seem to have arrived at a, a similar idea as to how we wish to treat the character. And, of course, Stephen and John have been putting in no end of ideas, which I've been picking up on. We're just very much in tune on the book. I mean, I don't know if I could do it without them, because they're, they are just so incredible. They get everything absolutely right. What I'm trying to do is to get into a character who's uh, almost an elemental force, Swamp Thing's intelligence is not human. Uh, he experiences what's going on in the soil and the plant life around him. He knows where the insects are laying their eggs. He knows, you know, where the fish are spawning and sort of stuff like that. He's got the whole swamp inside his mind. He's connected to it. And that perspective, it's, it's an alien intelligence. He sees things differently to human beings. His values are different. And he's 
he's like an earth spirit. He's a, a very primal character, uh, a very pagan character. And that's the way I've been trying to sort of interpret him, that his, his thought processes are very slow and geologic, but um, that, yeah, he has got this sort of empathy with the earth and the plant life and the bugs and the birds. And it just gives a different perspective. It's a very interesting, well, to me anyway, it's a very interesting perspective to write about, to sort of try and get the reader involved in an utterly alien experience, to sort of drag them into something that they've not experienced before, to get them to see through the eyes of this vegetable, you know, to, to see what the world's like from the, uh, the point of view of its plant life. The anatomy lesson was the first turning point in the life of the Swamp Thing. The controversial Love and Death was another, because it was published without the Comic Code approval. I feel very smug about that. I sort of hug myself in the middle of the night when I think about that, because uh, I like the idea of having Swamp Thing free of the code. Not so that we can do any grotesque physical violence or sex, but so that we can do stories that an adult could read. and find something interesting in them. You know, and the, the fact that we wrote this story, uh, I believe the actual issue 29 <coughs> was the one that caused the, the problems. But uh, in that, yeah, I mean, Karen uh, really backed us on that. Karen Berger, the book's editor, she, she really went and fought for it. And her and Dick Giordano made this, this very brave decision to go without the code, for which I'm eternally grateful for them. You know, it's, it's, that was terrific. I mean, with issue 29, uh, I think that one of the uh, one of the things that happened there was it was a difference in cultures, you know, like uh, I, I didn't realize that incest and necrophilia were still frowned on socially over here, you know, because uh, of course in England they're part of the, the whole social fiber, you know, if I'd known that I wouldn't have done the story, but, but it happened and, and there you go. You know. If you ask somebody outside the comics arena what they think of comics, the first thing they think of is Adam West with his paunch and sort of running up the side of the building and the bam sock pow and all that sort of stuff, which is not a very sort of uh, endearing image, you know. I think I think we'd like to be taken a little bit more seriously than that, and I don't think that a lot of the films that are coming out about comic book characters are helping any. I'd like to see someone do a really serious film that was that was as well written as the comics are sometimes, you know. I mean, I think that would be nice, but uh, I've not got any real hope of it happening in the immediate future. I've got no great desire uh, to do anything other than comics. I think that it's a bit of a shame that sometimes people tend to regard, even people in the industry tend to regard comics as the poor relation. It's something to be doing until they get a job on television or writing proper novels or, you know, doing films. I mean, for me, that tends to degrade comics a little bit. I think that if comics aren't the art form that they should be, it's the fault of me and the other people in the field. We should be doing something about it. And I think that comics are a wonderful art form, and I think that nobody really uh, since the, the great era of American newspaper strips, nobody really has come anywhere close to sort of realising the possibilities of comics. I, I think there's an awful lot of work to do. It's very much like if the first films had been short children's cartoon films, and as a result of that, people had said, well, this is obviously a medium for kids, then you'd never have had a Citizen Kane, you, you'd never have had a Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, Net, all these films just would not have happened because they're adult films and uh, they wouldn't have occurred in a children's medium. And that's what's happened in comics. People say comics are for kids, so therefore, you know, it's got to the stage where unless you want to put a comic out which probably hasn't got a market for it, you do something for kids. Now, that's starting to change now. And I could see, with a bit of luck, in, in ten years maybe we'll have a medium that will be as important as films or as literature. In England, though, aren't comics are taken more seriously than in this country? Perhaps slightly, but I think that in general, in the rest of Europe, in France, in Italy, in Spain, comics are taken very seriously. You'll, you'll find a review of a comic book alongside a review of a new ballet or a new film. Uh, you can open the papers and, and nobody thinks that you're retarded for reading comics. It's something that an adult can do without uh, risking social disgrace. You know, whereas um, I think in this country and in, in my own country, I think that the people who read comics, um, well, it's a bit like people who collect barbed wire. It, it's very interesting, but you wouldn't want one moving in next door to you. You know, and uh, I think there is that stigma attached. You're, you're regarded as abnormal if you don't stop reading comics at the age of 12. 
you know, and, yeah, and that's true in my country as well as yours. It's changing. I mean, hopefully, I'll, I'll be able to do this job in ten years and sort of walk down the street and hold my head up proud, you know. But uh, yeah, at the moment, it's it's still regarded as a a very cheap pulp gutter medium. How yeah. do you see that changing? Or, uh, or how do you see the implementation of that? Well, I think that, for one thing, we have to break out of the current ghetto that comics are in, in that comics have been wooing a fairly small audience of fans, because those fans are regular readers, they'll buy the book month after month, they can be depended upon. Now, that's good in terms of short-term short -term sales, but in the long term, it means that your audience is shrinking and just getting smaller and smaller as you appeal to a a more select and specialised minority. What we need to do is to get people who've not read comics before. Uh, I did hear from Steve Bissett that on one of the panels that he'd been sort of talking on, talking to some of the fans, that there were a lot of Swamp Thing fans who were coming to the book not from comics, but from Stephen King and Peter Straub. And if we can get that sort of readership, if we can grab um, a part of that adult readership that reads proper respectable books, then I think we'll, we'll be home and dry. I mean, another thing that I would like to see is more women reading comics, because uh, there's a whole vast audience out there who just won't touch a comic book, and I can understand why they won't touch it, because there's really nothing in comics to attract a woman, because it's mainly boys' power fantasies, you know, which, I'm, is, as a boy, I mean, I enjoy them as much as anybody else, but I can see that uh, for women there's something lacking, and... I think DC are starting to move in that direction. They're planning to sort of do things that perhaps will dra drag in the women readers. And I think that would be a, that would be a big step forward.